so much for that incredible introduction. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to be here this evening with such an incredible panel of distinguished guests. And I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation about what is undoubtedly an incredibly important topic. And this issue of how much attention and how much coverage to give terrorists and how much time to spend discussing terrorism is something that I think a lot of us have thought about. As, my, uh, as being a journalist myself who has covered many terrorist attacks, it is something I have often grappled with. Are we part of the solution? Are we part of the problem? How much is too much? Certainly, it's something we can't ignore, but are we spending too much time on it? Or, as President Donald Trump has suggested, are we not covering it enough? So there are a lot of different viewpoints on this uh, on this topic, and that's why we're so lucky to have this incredible panel. The official title of tonight's debate is Don't Give Them What They Want, Terrorists Should Be Starved of the Oxygen of Publicity. And I should say, we're not gonna do this as a sort of strict formal debate tonight, but what I will do is take a show of hands in the beginning of the evening, and then uh, at the end of the evening as well, so we can get a feel for how people's thoughts has changed as the evening um, has progressed. And of course, after we hear from all of our incredible speakers, uh, in about 45 minutes time, we'll open up the floor for Q&A so that you can also uh, pick some of these incredible minds. So without further ado, let me begin to introduce our incredible panel. I start here with, to my left, Simon Jenkins, who is, of course, uh, one of the UK's leading commentators. He was the editor of the Evening Standard, the editor of The Times, was chairman of the National Trust. He still writes a column weekly for The Guardian and also for The Evening Standard, and you can see him often on the BBC. And of course, he writes a lot about this topic of terrorism and national security issues in general. Next, we have Fouaz Jerjis, who is a frequent guest on CNN. Um, we're privileged to have him. He is a professor of international relations at the LSE, and really, he is one of the world's foremost experts on this issue of jihadi terrorism. And he has written a couple of incredible books on this topic, one of which I'm just going to shamelessly plug Thank right you. now, A History of ISIS. If you haven't read it, I'm being serious and sincere. It's an excellent book. Um, and he's also written another very good book about the rise and fall of Al-Qaeda. And last but certainly not least, we have Douglas Murray, who is the associate editor at The Spectator. Uh, he is also a best-selling author and an award-winning political commentator. He focuses particularly on the UK and the US, but also on issues of foreign policy, terrorism, national security, and the Middle East. So you've got a lot of brain power going on here tonight. Um, so what I'd like to do right now before we have our opening comments is to get a share, a, a sort of show of hands from you guys as to where, what your thinking is on this. So uh, those who agree with the motion that terrorists should be starved of the oxygen of publicity, can you put up your hands? Those who agree. Okay. All right, that's a, that's a pretty big chunk. Okay, mm. that's interesting. And now can I ask those who disagree to put up their hands. Mm. So it looks like the uh, supporters of the motion are in the majority at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, <laughs> and those who don't know? <laughs> okay, a minority. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm sure everyone's gonna have a very firm opinion by the time we finish <clears throat> hearing from our guests. Um, so let me start now with you, Simon, if you would like to give your opening remarks. I think if you believe that the terrorists should be starved of the oxygen of publicity, why are you here? My point of view, for what it's worth, is that I don't think terrorism is very important. Um, and I think we make it important, um, and by making it important, we make it important. Uh, it does not matter very much. Uh, a terrorist incident is, is a happening. It's an accident. Uh, it, it affects the people directly affected by it. Um, but terrorism does not threaten states. It doesn't threaten the integrity of America or Britain. Um, th th they can't invade us. Um, they can't do serious damage to our economy unless we let them. They cannot affect our values, our democracy, anything like that, unless we let them. Um, they, are, they are, to all intents and purposes, useless criminals. They simply blow things up and kill people. Uh, the only point at which they threaten us is by our reaction to them. They have no standing whatsoever, other than in terms of our reaction to them. 
And our reaction to them is conditioned by the publicity we give them. Uh, they depend upon publicity. The multiplier of publicity is what makes the Terrorism Act terrorist. Otherwise, it's just a killing. Uh, that's why very few terrorist incidents occur in, in autocratic and dictatorial countries. They don't get any publicity. Uh, they get publicity where we give them publicity, and it's on that publicity that they feed. Uh, ISIS, interestingly, last week said they regard publicity as their nuclear weapon. It's the thing they rely upon to make their impact. Uh, we've become completely obsessed with them. Terrorism has been seized upon by the military defense establishment, um, effectively to boost their budgets. Terrorists should be dealt with by, by crime uh, watchers, by police, by intelligence agents, and so on. They're not a source of, of aircraft carriers or bombers, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, we have gone far too far in reacting to them, and Donald Trump, who sooner or later will be mentioned this evening, um, uh, illustrates that so well by saying we should give them more publicity. What a lunatic thing to do. Uh, I simply think that the best thing we can possibly do is you cannot not cover news. And I'm sure tonight we'll discuss what this really means. You can't not cover news. Uh, you then hand the terrorist over to the much more terrorist thing, which is the rumor. You mustn't allow rumor to dominate news. But we mustn't over-exaggerate the significance of a terrorist incident. Um, the BBC spent four days on the Nice uh, atrocity. Um, Obama comes over to march uh, in honor of the, um, the, the Hebdo uh, massacres. It was an appalling way of glorifying this particular obs ob uh, obscenity. I feel so strongly that the least we can do to publicize terrorists, the more we're likely to defeat them. I just have to ask you, though, you mentioned you say terrorism doesn't threaten states. Do you, I mean, it may not affect or threaten directly Western states, but if you look at Middle Eastern states, or Iraq, mm. for example, it seems that ISIS got pretty far in challenging their power. ISIS is, is an insurgency. Uh, terrorism is a mechanism. It's not an ideology. Terrorism is, is a form of attack. Uh, you, you, you try and kill people, uh, you try and cause an atrocity in order to terrify someone to change them get them to change their mind or change their policy. Um, ISIS is an insurgency, which is occupying territory now. That's a completely different matter from terrorism. They happen to use terrorist methods, but they're not, they're, their essence is not terrorism. Their essence is the setting up of a caliphate. So, I mean, I, I, I come back to my point. There's no point in terrorism if you don't give it publicity. Okay. <clears throat> For was. Well, I, uh, I'm going to probably, I, I agree to a great extent with Simon, but I, before I do so in the debate, I, I want to I have two points in terms of context. Uh, the first point is that one of the lessons I have learned over really the last 20 years working on these groups, we call them social movements, uh, social movement that use violence for political purposes. One of the lessons is that whether you're talking about Al-Qaeda or ISIS, they're waging two battles. One battle on the battlefield to carry out attacks, whether in Iraq, or Syria, or Libya, or Egypt, or Istanbul. And one battle is really for the hearts and mind. One battle for, to get publicity. They crave publicity. In fact, I would argue in their eyes, in the eyes of whether it was Osama bin Laden or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the greater jihad is not to carry out attacks. The greater jihad is to get more publicity, to get. The reason why publicity and coverage is very important because it's a force multiplier. And there are three reasons why publicity matters, coverage matters. First, they want to basically uh, trigger fear. Uh, I mean, the institution of terrorism, as you've said, it's all about fear. Uh, it's about really creating fears, instilling fear, terrorizing the enemy, and also about inspiring and motivating the base. They want to motivate the base, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan, or even some of the deluded young men in Western societies. And they also, as a potential recruitment technique. So when CNN and BBC and all of us go and talk about the attacks in Paris or Brussels, or this is basically feeds into their narrative. They matter. They matter greatly. They have the capacity to terrorize Western societies. In fact, many of us now focus on ISIS. As somehow ISIS has invented uh, the so-called social media. Let's remember that it was Osama bin Laden who pioneered the strategy of really appealing to the media. He turned his humble cave in Afghanistan into a meeting room where basically world-class, I mean, uh, reporters visited his cave in Afghanistan. Let's remember Peter Bergen of the CNN, Robert Fisk of the Independent, Abdel Bari Atwan, and many others. In fact, in the eyes of Osama bin Laden, the media was it. He wants to spread his message. He wants to basically get his message near and far, not only to Muslim audiences, 
but also to certain constituency in the West. So we need, when we talk about coverage regardless, that this is plays into their own narrative. It matters a great deal. They crave publicity. The second point, in terms of context, I want to, and I want to come back to Simon's point. I mean, what we need to take, I mean, into account, uh, again, if we take all the terrorist attacks uh, that have taken place since the mid-1990s, terrorism does not represent a strategic threat. Terrorism basically represents a limited nuisance, limited nuisance. Um, it's so sad and tragic when you have the Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, saying ISIS represents an existential threat to the West. ISIS represents an existential threat to the West. Well, the hell with the West if ISIS really threatens yeah, the West. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, the same thing with, I mean, Donald Trump now. He criticized the American media for not covering, I mean, terrorism enough. Again, you have now Western leaders who are using terrorism as a political tool, as a, a... And to come back to the argument that terrorism really represents a limited nuisance as opposed to a strategic threat. I mean, look what since 9-11. The average annual on between 19, between 2001 and 2015, we estimate that only six individuals have been killed in the United States and the United Kingdom in incidents related to Islamist terrorism. Annually, you're talking about six individuals who have been killed in the United States and the UK as a result of terrorist incident. We know that basically lightning in the United States kills 30 people annually. We know hundreds of people get killed as a result of deer causing incidents. Um, in Ohio itself, nine people die every day as a result of doses, high doses. Again, we need to keep, I'm not suggesting that terrorism is not insidious, is not dangerous. But what I'm trying to say is that too much publicity basically plays into the narrative of ISIS. Final point, I'm not suggesting we should not cover terrorism, because terrorism matters to, it's a, it's a newsworthy uh, thing. It matters a great deal. It should be proportional, it should be, we should put it in perspective, we should have resilience, and the final point, by really, I mean, overplaying, inflating terrorism, we are terrorizing ourselves. This is really what, uh, this is. So you're not advocating for sort of self-censorship, but you're saying that media coverage should be more responsible, more nuanced, and there should be less of it? Absolutely, and we, shall, we should tell the audience about, I mean, the effects of terrorism, the impact of terrorism, as opposed to, you know more than I do, how many days we have spent on the, I mean, uh, terrorist attacks in Paris or Brussels. They were horrible, they were insidious, they were dangerous. But it was a kind of, I mean, playing into the narrative of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Giving them ammunition, providing them with the oxygen. This is their greatest jihad, because they appeal to the base. We are invincible. We are indefeatable. We are bleeding the West, terrorizing the West. In a way, it's the oxygen that mm -hmm. sustains the narrative. And again, we are terrorizing our incidents. Final point, I know we'll come back to it. Let me turn the table on its head and say we're talking about whether terrorism provides oxygen to groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Let me say that as a result of this obsession, in fact, our coverage and obsession with terrorism, we are providing oxygen to populist movement in Western societies. We are dis distorting domestic politics in the West. In fact, this obsession with these kind of limited threat is providing oxygen to hyper, you know, far-right movements. And in many ways, it's really changing, dramatically transforming Western politics, not just playing into the narrative of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Okay. Douglas, are you going to jump into the rescue of Western media? Oh. Uh, <laughs> not likely. Um, <laughs> Um, but thank you. Great pleasure to be here. I'm very glad this isn't a debate format because I think this question is so complex and I think most of us have such um, contrary views were on this. It's a very good thing that it's not set up as an either or thing. Um, first thing I, I would say, but I agree very much with what Farwaz just said about uh, that Cameron point. I, I entirely agree. I thought it was an absurd, uh, indeed obscene thing for a Prime Minister of the UK to say that ISIS is an existential threat uh, when it's no such thing. However, I do have to point back, uh, push back a little on something that Simon has already said. Um, 
terrorism can do serious damage. And as everybody knows, just from that one thing that's already come up twice this evening, the attacks in Paris in November 2015, it still is doing damage. Uh, it's still the uh, Parisian economy, the tourist economy has not recovered from that. It's still a, a city suffering from that. Now, I don't know how you could get into a situation where multiple suicide bombings go off in our nearest, the nearest capital city to this one, uh, where multiple suicide bombings go off at a football match, at a rock venue, <clears throat> drive-by shootings, Kalashnikov attacks in cafes and restaurants, and that wasn't reported, or it just was mentioned, and we all got on with our lives. The public want to know that information. We want to know, I'm going to go to Paris next weekend. Is it a wise idea? Is it, is it, is it good to go or not? Of course we need this information, and we need the media to be reporting it. And I have to say that we have to appreciate what the end point of Simon's uh, 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 point of view on this is. In 2013, when two British converts uh, to Islam, uh, two very radical young men, uh, beheaded, ran over in broad daylight in South London, in this city, ran over uh, a, a soldier at home on leave from Afghanistan, Drummer Lee Rigby, hacked at his body in the middle of the road, tried to get his head off with machetes, and so on. Simon described that as a mundane act of violence. Now, okay. I don't think that is a mundane, mundane act. It was in your Guardian column at the time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. It, it, it was a mundane act of violence. <laughs> <laughs> but, you see, for most of us, the general public, we don't think that the reporting of a soldier being decapitated in broad daylight by two such men is a mundane thing. Uh, it is certainly an act of violence, but we have to be very careful. That is, that is the end point of dismissing the terrorists, of saying we don't give them any oxygen. We, we, we try to, um, uh, to, to get around it in some way. Now, I think, by the way, that, that the censorship around terrorism already exists to an enormous extent in our societies. The media uh, in this country and in America and elsewhere don't show uh, anything like explicit images of the aftermaths of terrorist attacks. And there is a very good argument that actually if the public saw what those of us who've covered and seen uh, attacks have seen, that their views on this would be a lot harder than they currently are. And that the media actually holds this back from the public. And that as a result, the public are less uh, um, enraged than they would otherwise be by this. But you know, if you support the motion tonight, uh, how would you do it? How would you stop covering the terrorists when they carry out an attack in Paris for night and kill 130 people and leave many more wounded for the rest of their lives. How would you do it? How would you do it in the <coughs> age of the internet? Okay, it's plausible. You could get a press regulatory body uh, so rigorous that it stopped the remainder of the print press from publishing any information about it. People would go to the internet. How do you shut down the internet from covering this? Now, having said that, there's, there's one very important point on this which is that obviously the press have to show restraint. And I want to give you two very quick examples uh, in my life of the press clearly not showing restraint on this. And this is where there will be some unanimity on the panel tonight. In 2004, when the British-born uh, uh, man, Ken Bigley, was uh, held hostage in Iraq by Abu Musab al-Zakawi's group, uh, many of you will remember this. There was a drip, drip feed of information on an hourly and daily basis by Zakawi's group. And th they knew, and we knew from the moment that American forces ended up getting into his compound, that his group were watching the British media like hawks because Tony Blair was being personally held responsible by a man being held uh, hostage with a knife to his throat. And if you remember, that man, Ken Bigley, was saying on camera, I blame Tony Blair. And the British press were blaming Tony Blair. And there was a moment there where the combination of uh, a, a, an extremist group and the British press effectively helping them could well have brought down a prime minister in a democratic society. He came very, very close at that point. And the second example I would give was 10 years after that, in 2014, when uh, Jihadi John, uh, as he was called, uh, Mohammed Anwazi, another British citizen, was uh, executing, murdering, uh, beheading people in the Syrian desert. I would argue that was another time when the British 
press needed to show restraint, and a lot of it did. You'll remember that The Independent ran a front page saying that we are not showing the photo of this. That may have been an extreme example, but the British uh, press, once again on that occasion, the international press, were being used by that group to have this drum beat of terror. So on that, I think there'll be some agreement. I think that the British press, by and large, does show restraint. I don't think we cannot cover the terrorists, but there are occasions when the press in this country and elsewhere has got it very badly wrong. Well, so let me ask you, you know, you bring up Jihadi John, and I think this is an interesting one. Why, why, why give him a nickname like Jihadi John? Why not call him by his name, Mohammed al muazi sure. Why do we have to come up? The uh, very okay. idea yeah. of coming up with nicknames, and also I wanted to ask you about a distinction between covering ISIS propaganda and terrorist attacks. There's a big difference between running their yes. videos of them with the black and white flag mm. saying the Shahada and showing what happened in Paris, right? Yes, there is. No, there's a very big difference between the two. And sometimes we fall into covering both as if they were the same thing. Um, but as, as for that, the, the nickname point is a very uh, good point. I, I'm uh, slightly bemused by it myself. Uh, of course, we didn't know his name was Mohammed M. Wazi when we knew that he existed and he was the, the decapitator. So he had to be given some term, I suppose. I do think that the sort of weird jokiness of it is... The Beatles, we, we I yeah. think, coined the term um, in the British press. I, I don't know why people do it. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a coping mechanism about something very grotesque and that you can sort of slightly laugh at it. I don't know. Mm. It, it, it doesn't seem very healthy to me. I've always thought that it familiarizes barbarism. So let me, uh, let me ask you, Simon, and we'll, we'll sort of have a bit more of a fluid chat now. But, it, you know, I mean, what you're essentially talking about amounts to self-censorship on, on a certain level. And I just wonder, does it confuse the role of the journalist at all? Because the journalist traditionally <clears throat> is not supposed to be a judge. The journalist is supposed to be someone who is a filter, who provides information to people who want to receive that information. Well, I mean, let, 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 let's go back to that point. Um, what makes news? Um, news of someone issuing a press release is boring. Uh, news of somebody saying, um, I think you're a bunch of infidels and I wish you'd change your minds and become Islamist, is, 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 is boring. Um, so they do something truly horrific because they know that horrific things make news. Uh, you then have a problem. Um, that's what they want you to do. I mean, it's because some Chinese philosopher said, always ask what your enemy most wants you to do. We always answer terrorism with what they most want us to do. We fall straight into the trap of doing what they want. <coughs> But is now, it not our job? Well, it's not our job to do their job for it. It really isn't our job. But what I do think is new, and this is, in a sense, the, 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 the point where, where, where we, we might discuss it, um, is this is quite unlike other forms of news. This is a form of, when you're covering a war, you're covering a war. Uh, in this case, you are a part of the story, because that's what the other side wants you to be. And in becoming a part of the story, you are, as you said at the beginning, a part of the problem rather than the solution. And I just think, what I'm saying here is I think for, for, for newspapers, it is no good simply saying, we cover every story. Mm. Um, because in the first place, you have, as, 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 um, you know, as, as we've been saying, you have a decision to make about how, how intensively you cover it. I mean, do, do you fly Hugh Edwards out to Nice, which is what the BBC did? Um, I mean, that's exactly what I'm sure I said. Please, will you fly Hugh Edwards out to Nice? Thank you very much, BBC. You've done what you wanted, to do, what you, wanted you to do. Um, you, you have a decision to make as to how intensively you cover a story. But I go beyond that, really, and say you are now the story. You are a part of what the other side wants to happen. So, and Doug you, you, can't, you can't just simply say, it's like another story. Okay, Douglas, do you agree with that? Is there essentially a synchronicity going on or a symbiosis between ISIS or groups like ISIS and the media? Are they, are they kind of playing into each other somehow? Yes, they are. I mean, we know the extent to which uh, people, for instance, in ISIS use uh, the internet to see what their coverage is like, you know, that day. I mean, there are, there are cases of this. Um, so there's obviously a, a synchronicity. I think, by the way, the whole thing plays into a, a thing which, I mean, it's not just on this subject, but on any subject. What is, what is the, the, the normal routine in the media now in the era of 24-hour news? Something happens. You need somebody to react to the something. Then you need somebody to bring on the story. But every journalist, anyone who's ever worked in journalism will know this. You know, you get a call from BBC, CNN or something. The Prime Minister said this uh, about this happening. I wonder if you'd call for this. <laughs> you know, and you think, well, no. 
usually. Uh, um, uh, usually it's in politics, it's uh, somebody calls for somebody's resignation. You know, that's another kick of the wheel. The story goes on a bit longer. Now there have been calls for the resignation of this person after this thing that's happened, and so on and so on. So there is a, there is a, there is a momentum to all news stories. Keep pushing it, keep pushing it forward. And the, the, the reason why, I mean, personally, I don't watch the, if you don't mind me saying so, the 24-hour news after any terrorist attack, because something terrible has happened, and one doesn't learn very much about it by the, you know, the presence of said you know, major reporter standing some miles away you know, from the scene. Or the, the best one, not to be too light-hearted about it, but I mean, it wasn't the terrorist attack. You'll remember that when the that Russian submarine went down, uh, Donetsk, uh, 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 some years ago. Uh, the BBC ended up renting a helicopter to fly over the sea uh, to show a bit of sea. <laughs> and and then, then, on air, it turned out that they weren't allowed to fly over the bit of sea which the submarine was under because the Russian authorities had ordered a, a blockade over the airspace. So the BBC, just at enormous expense, had covered a bit of sea like the bit of sea. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, yeah. fair enough. I mean, but for us, I mean, don't you think there is a need? I mean, I, because I think the point that we seem to be dancing around here a little bit is not that one shouldn't cover it or give them attention. It's about the kind of attention you're giving them. Absolutely. And instead of giving them catchy little nicknames, how about doing some real hard-hitting reporting that looks into ISIS as being a symptom of something and not necessarily a cause? I mean, I think what we need to understand is that... Uh, there is a, two wars, and the, the, the other war, the media war, really is strategic for both Al-Qaeda and ISIS. That everything they do in order to really, I mean, get attention. Everything they do is they want to instill fear and terrorize the public, whether you're talking about Iraq or Syria or Libya or Western societies. In many ways, we have to make decisions how much coverage we give to the, I mean, certain particular attacks. I mean, let's remember, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you away from... Uh, I mean, the, the, the media itself, that initially ISIS is not really interested, was not interested initially in carrying out attacks against the far enemy, against Western societies. In fact, ISIS differs dramatically from Al-Qaeda because the basic focus of ISIS is on the near enemy, whether you're talking about Iraq or whether you're talking about Syria or Libya or Egypt. The reason why ISIS has decided to attack Western target because, again, it, it, because it perceives basically the U.S. that alliance with France and, and uh, uh, the United Kingdom. So in this particular sense, we need to talk about why ISIS has decided to attack certain Western targets. What has happened? You know, what, what's the strategic mindset of both Al-Qaeda and ISIS? We're not doing this. And in many ways, I mean, if you, if you follow, and, and in fact, ISIS is delighted by the coverage it's getting, whether you're talking about Brussels or Paris or Germany or other places. So what's the alternative, though? I still don't really have a feel for what the alternative I mean, is. I think we, we, have to, we have to talk about these attacks. But think about it. I mean, you, you covered the attacks in Paris. I mean, nonstop for days, several days, every single television station. I mean, the, the, the amount of coverage is overwhelming. It's just overwhelming. I mean, you, you covered it yourself. Mm. And this is exactly what ISIS wants you to do you're basically playing into the narrative of ISIS because ISIS basically is appealing to the base, ISIS is motivating, inspiring the base, and also ISIS is saying, well, look, we have capacity. We have capacity to strike at the heart of European societies. It's also as a recruitment technique. And we know, in fact, we have covered, after every attack, basically increased number of young men and women who tend to migrate to these particular groups, whether you're talking about Syria or Iraq or Libya. Well, the, the, you, what do we do about it? Mm. It's a reasonable question. Because we have I mean, a responsibility to our viewers and our readers, too, and they do care about terrorism. They do think it's well, important. I mean, c c care important? Yeah. I mean, well, what, what I is, mean, you know, we can all sit here with our lofty ambitions and be like, oh, they don't understand. It's not strategically important. But, but they, peop they do feel it's, it's important. It's ghoulish. It is a particular sort of horror deliberately designed to appeal to the ghoulish um, voyeurism in the viewer. That's what they're doing. Now, the question is, how do we respond to it? Now, there's a good, reasonable question. I think myself that, it is, as I said before, it's quite unlike any other story. We're not just covering the story. We're, we're covering a very particular sort of story. And, and, and I just think it's incumbent upon the media represented here um, to, 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 to ask themselves, now, how do we exercise self-restraint? Because it is about restraint. 
I mean, at the moment, it's, it's, I mean, an American president is building his presidency on terrorism. It's ridiculous. How on earth do we draw back from the state of, 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 of this obsessiveness? Um, I think for what it's worth, that, 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 that the, the, the press regulatory bodies as such as they are, and the professional bodies, ought to be preparing protocols, um, conferences, discussions about how we react to terrorist incidents. They ought to be, I mean, most or, news organizations, I think probably entire, including yours, do have a sort of protocol. I mean, um, Le Monde uh, tried to restrain naming terrorists. Mm. Um, a lot of press organizations have ways in which they do handle this, and they are moderately effective. But I, I can see a situation in which, in which almost the government of the day says, not, not censorship, it says, look, you guys, you're really, a, you're really a part of the problem. You're a menace. But it's Will a fine line with censorship. censorship. But, uh, so, I mean, you yeah. asked, I mean, of course, yeah. the public apologies. Do you want to finish? Yeah, I, no, 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 no. I mean, the question is, to what extent does the coverage, the extensive, the overwhelming, the addictive coverage really produce certain public reactions? To what extent, in many ways, we are pooling, pouring, I mean, gasoline on a raging fire. Just at the end, the last year of Barack Obama, the American public, I mean, we have surveys about this, the American public was, I mean, almost majorities opposed to any kind of American intervention, other in Iraq or Syria. And in, this, in the space of about four or five months, there was a marked, basically, difference in the reaction of the American public. Mm. A majority of Americans basically, I mean, the views changed dramatically as a result of the media coverage of the barbarities mm -hmm. that basically taking place against Americans. Well, I don't know whether there was a causal link between how the media covered particular events and the change in the American attitudes about intervention or whether somehow I mean, the, the barbarities themselves brought about the, the uh, change in the American and, and, and I think you raise an interesting point there, and I wonder, Douglas, if you could sort of expand on that a bit. You know, there, is there an argument to be made? We've heard President Donald Trump come out and say, we're not covering terrorism enough. And uh, to all of us who work in news, I think we were like, you must be taking the piss, <laughs> was probably the first reaction. Yeah. And then they provided this list of, you know, I mean, various attacks in Europe, many of which, in fact, we hadn't covered because they were incidents where maybe one person was stabbed and mm. because the threshold is probably yeah. quite high at this stage for it to become a, you know, leading a, a news broadcast. But You didn't do enough on Sweden, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but do you think there's an argument to be made on the other side that we're not covering it enough, that we're trying to sanitize it, that by not showing the images, as you said, um, that by not sort of, you know, Go, going well, over every single incident. Well, can I... Uh, f firstly, well, the, um, the press, already, the media, already does a fair amount of editorialising before you even get to the discussion we're having. Mm. Let me give you one example. Um, ISIS, which is the subject of Fawaz's book. Uh, Thank you. If you'd like to hold it up again. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. I've got a 10% no, deal. <laughs> but, uh, no. Um, uh, ISIS, now, now the, the main uh, broadcaster here in the UK, the one that we all pay for, the one that is, I think, responsible for uh, the fact that our media is not as divided as it is, in, for instance, in America, as much to be said for the BBC. The BBC uh, chose to not use that term. It's uh, so-called Islamic State, uh, as the BBC. Well, that's an editorial decision it takes about the group. I've often said, if, if I keep on hearing the BBC called the so-called Islamic State, more times I'll put my so-called shoes through the so-called television. <laughs> um, it, but it's an infuriating uh, editorial decision which never let, they've taken before you've even got to reporting the story. That's why you can speak to a lot of people in this country who, despite this, uh, uh, what we're talking about here being an over-coverage, still have very little idea of what it is that ISIS wants. Mm. Because we actually don't have a lot of that discussion because our broadcasters and our press don't want to have a lot of that discussion. And so we go round and round on the pornography of violence. Mm. I'd much rather we had those, uh, those bigger and deeper discussions that meant you, you, that, that people knew what was actually going on with this group, what they actually want, and what groups like them want. But just very quickly, I've got to pick up as well on this, on this mention about Sweden, if I may, because this, this actually does get to a core uh, divide that's going on at the moment. I do not enjoy the bifurcation of American media, I have to say. I don't like the fact that increasingly... Uh, these are two sides talking about each other, but never to each other. Uh, and I think it's enormously regrettable for democracy as a whole. Um, that said, there is a specific problem which the, which the Sweden story actually talks to. Now, as it happens, I've just finished the book 
uh, which, uh, <laughs> which Fawaz will be, uh, by agreement, pro uh, public, uh, promoting any moment. No, uh, which comes out in May. But it's, it's about uh, the migration crisis in Europe. And I've been spending quite a bit of time in Sweden, among other countries. And there are, now it's not terrorism on a daily basis, but there are so many societal problems that have broken out in Sweden in the last few years. And you very, very rarely see anything about it in the press and the media in this country or in America. And I think that, 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 that what happened in this is emblematic of a problem. So the media doesn't cover the story. Okay, you could say, well, who cares about Sweden? Or it's just, you know, it's just this. But the fact is that it's the non-coverage of that, of a very serious story, and then a sort of cack-handed reference to it by the American president that is responded to mm. by the liberal media saying, ha, 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 it's so hilarious. Sweden's just this wonderful place where everyone's just doing IKEA stuff all the time. <laughs> is a horrible, horrible deepening of the divide. May, may I just, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you, you have mentioned Donald Trump and what... <laughs> What, what really worries me a great deal uh, is not about whether we discuss, I mean, the phenomenon of terrorism. We should. Uh, I think the phenomenon of terrorism is going to be with us for the next 20, 30 years. It's byproduct of globalization. It's part of the breakdown of societies in the Muslim world, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria. Uh, really, what we are seeing in the West here, basically, the reverberations of the breakdown of the state system in many countries. I mean, this is just, that's why I said it's nuisance. What, what alarms me a great deal is when I hear Donald Trump and other politicians in the heart of Europe collapsing terrorism with the refugees, mm -hmm. collapsing terrorism with migration, <laughs> collapsing terrorism with Islam. And, this is, and then you have a big existential problem in our hands. This is really where Western politics now, this is the question, this is the challenge. How do you separate, how do you delink the phenomenon of terrorism, which is dangerous, in a limited way, right? Limited way. I mean, I call them really organized networks of criminality. Why do we treat terrorism different than the mafia? Mm. Why do we invest terrorism with existential cultural overtones? I mean, the overwhelming majority of Muslims, I mean, I, this cliche, have nothing to do with ISIS or Al-Qaeda. The over, overwhelming majority of victims are Muslims whether in Iraq or Syria mm. or Libya or Egypt or Afghanistan. But this is what we really are going round and round the question. To what extent does Donald Trump now use, and he has used the question of ISIS very effectively, okay, politicians in the heart of Europe. Douglas okay. itching just, to just, just get quick, in there. Uh, it's slightly off the topic, but just it reiterates the point I was just trying to make which is that an absence on one side creates something on the other. And this is a very good example. The, uh, I said it for a long time. If, if your entire media says that Islamic extremism has nothing to do with Islam, you will create a movement that says it's all to do with Islam. Mm. And all Muslims must be involved. In the same way as if you pretend that no migrant uh, into Europe is ever going to be anything other than the most brilliant PhD student, <laughs> you will create a movement that says they're all terrorists. Yeah. I mean, that is part of the problem. Is he, I mean, is but, he, but, 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 but you, 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 how do you answer the problem? I'll come back to Chris's question. I mean, you, you, you've got a peculiar thing here. You've got a, um, a requirement which all intelligent sort of liberal people think, say, um, which is to cover responsibly world events. Um, uh, there are lots of terrorist incidents in the Congo, in Uganda, or N Nigeria, or Sudan. We just don't cover them. It's mm. darkest Africa. We don't cover them. It uh, doesn't matter how horrific they are. Yeah. We don't cover them because we've got this thing, we cover terrorists. And terrorists is something that happens to us in our country, mm. not in their country. Now, if we give terrorism what I still think is a ludicrously exaggerated extent of coverage, um, and, and I, I wouldn't go as far as you or Douglas in saying, you know, I, want, I want to show pictures of the dead bodies as well mm. um, in, in order to enra enrage the population no, I even further. Say we should, but yeah. um, uh, I mean, I, I, just, I, I just want to suppress that because unless you suppress these sort of tabloid images, it's very difficult to get a conversation going about what is happening in Nigeria or Sudan or somewhere else. Um, and and I, I do come to a point which I'd never ever thought I would in my life, with saying that I just somehow think the concept of censorship, self-censorship, but censorship, has got to be part of this debate, and it has not become that yet. But let so. me ask you this then, Simon, quickly, and then I will open it up to the floor, but just this idea of one thing we haven't touched on tonight is the idea that we all work in a business. 
It is a for-profit business, mm. okay? And media is changing <coughs> by the day. Mm. People go wherever they can for their information. Mm. It's not, no one buys, it, 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 you know, the, the methods of consumption are changing and people can go to where they want. Um, you, they don't have to come to us. And I guess if we engage in the kind of self-censorship or whatever you want to mm. call it, because I do think you raise a lot of fair points, what if people stop reading the Times or stop watching CNN or stop? Because I guarantee you, if they're interested in reading about it and they want to know more about it and you're not covering it, they will change the channel or change the website. Well, I mean, the, uh, that, that's not an answer. There's a question. Yes, the, the, um, that's why I'm I the mean, moderator I, I, and you're I, the panelist. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't think, I, I don't think the answer to the points we've been making is, is oh, you might lose money. Um, I, I, I'm old-fashioned enough to think that, that journalism, journalism is actually about a certain sort of ethic um, in which you try and find out what the truth is. You do not exaggerate the truth. You present the truth. Um, you don't become a part of the story. You stand back from the story. All these things old as the hills. Uh, always nagging at our shoulder is the sun or the tabloids or Hearst or whoever it might, might pull it. So, I mean, all these, these, these old gorillas always saying, oh, give us a better story. Give us a better story. You make more money that way. Um, the reason why I'm proud of journalism is, 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 is for a hundred years, enough journalists have said, I'm not going down that route. I'm going down the route which simply says what I think to be the, the, the correct way of looking at the world. And I'm going to go on doing that. Okay, this seems like a good point to open it up. We've got um, two ushers with roaming microphones, so you put up your hands. And if you're in the gallery space, there's a standing microphone there. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to keep your questions. First of all, if you don't mind standing up while you ask your question, and if you can keep them as succinct as possible, and I'm going to take them in bunches of three and distribute them to the panelists. So let's start with you. Um, I wanted to just encourage you all to keep the word perspective in mind. I'm really with Simon on this, that I believe we've reached a train wreck confluence of media, politics, and money. A station like CNN has now found that it is economically viable for them, no matter what happens, one plane crash, one terrorist attack, to have 80 million panels that go on around the clock asking people their opinion. There are wildfires in Chile, there are deaths in Congo, there is Ebola, there are scientists working on things, and I really encourage you to just deliberately give equal weight to other stories. Mm. And the people who want to read about ISIS all day long will do so, but most of us won't. Excellent mm -hmm. point. Is there a question? Do you agree? No, it's a <laughs> matter of yes. encouraging <laughs> you to keep doing what you're doing, but just don't give them the oxygen. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the question tonight is whether does the media react to terrorist events? I would like to ask, is the real problem that geostrategic powers overreact to terrorist events? So for example, one thing in this debate that I find very dangerous, we haven't mentioned terrorist attacks on India, for example. We forget after 9-11 there, there was an attack to destroy the parliament of India, to try and wrench Kashmir out of the Indian state and start a civil war on the subcontinent. We have the Mumbai attack of 2009, which though had a smaller death count than most of the wars of the 20th century, could have led to a war between Pakistan and India, which is the greatest location where a nuclear exchange should take place. A war of vastly destructive um, potential could take place due to smaller events. In the Middle East, for example, are we seeing the disintegration of Syria and Iraq into its sectarian elements? And terrorism is a symptom of the problem and not actually causing the problem. So for example, um, before 1914, the anarchists and their bombs could kill some thousands of people, but it was then the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and then the overreaction by geopolitical powers that then caused the massive problem that we now have. Okay, and another one? <laughs> I think it's clear that nobody is arguing for censorship. It's about restraint and against sensationalism. But if it's sensationalism, I would argue that, or, or ask, isn't, it, isn't that really a threat in terms of our reaction? Because it, uh, it feeds an agenda, even here, 
of people who want to um, curtail civil liberties. But the real threat now is that there is someone in the United States behind the president who believes in chaos. Um, I dread the next uh, uh, attack on the United States, which is bound to happen, because we really might see a genuine threat to democratic institutions given the people in power today. Isn't, isn't that a threat? Okay, Simon? another good question. <clears throat> and I'll take one more and then I'll distribute these to the panel. Should we have one from the gallery? Yes, sorry. I thought I was safe. Yeah. Um, I suppose, I think we've talked about this a little, Simon, you referenced it. We are talking about terror through a lens of terrorism that happens to white Westerners. And um, Douglas, you asked the question earlier, like how would we stop it? And I think the simple answer to how we stop it is that we do appear to stop it whenever it happens to Muslim people, brown people, black people. Look at what happened in Canada. And I know it's very easy for us all to say, nobody <coughs> changed their Facebook profile to a Canadian flag and says, just we Canada. But I, I, we need to have that discussion. Why are we as the media complicit in not covering terrorism that happens to people of other mm -hmm. faiths? Okay, so I'm loving how many American voices I'm hearing tonight. <laughs> um, That's a rare this comment. is our night, ladies. Okay, so let me start then by asking you, Simon, the first question, very interesting one. Is the real problem the media or is it geopolitical powers that are overstating the terrorist threat for their own strategic purposes? Well, f <clears throat> firstly, I mean, terrorism is not new, um, but it's new in the sort of global sense that it, no, no, we're now experiencing it. Um, <clears throat> we, are, we are completely obsessed with it. It's, it's the dominant... Uh, narrative of defense policy, for instance, which has nothing to do with terrorism, to my mind. Um, I mean, if, if soldiers have seized on it. We can, we can handle terrorism. Rubbish. And they just can't. Um, so it is new in that sense. But it's, 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 it's not new in another sense. I mean, people have always been mesmerized by extreme violence. And um, people have employed extreme violence in order to get their message across. Um, and to that extent, giving them what they want is what we've been doing. Uh, I, all I'm saying is that I think now it's, it's of a different order. Um, the fact that we don't cover certain terrorist incidents or certain terrible situations is not the same thing. Is, 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 is a different point. The point about terrorism is it depends upon the press. That's my point. But I guess, mm. you know, the, the gentleman who asked the question was mm. also posing the idea of, <laughs> uh, you know, are people like President Trump using the fear of terrorism or the threat of terrorism to try to push through their own agenda? Well, I mean, th this is one of the many reasons for not not exaggerating the threat of terrorism. Mm. I mean, as, as, as the questioner here said, I mean, do you really want to allow um, a, a, real, a, a massive drive against civil liberty in the, in the cause of somehow suppressing terrorism? They're not connected at all, but, but they're used by, within any society. Mm. There are elements in government that want to clamp down on things. Mm. And the clampers down have seized on terrorism. I mean, our own home office have seized on terrorism um, as a reason for clamping down on things. Now, that's giving into terrorism, if anything was. For was, I wonder if you might pick up on that, because I do think that relates to the second question uh, from the woman who was talking about, you know, her very real fears about President Trump, and I think there was a not-so-covert message, uh, allusion to Steve Bannon there as well. Um, but I, I wonder if the idea of sensationalism plays into this in a much more sinister and dangerous way, not from giving into the terrorists or giving the terrorists what they want, but in this case to giving politicians perhaps what they want. Thanks, Helen, for your question. I mean, to come back to Simon uh, in his uh, introduction, has said uh, correctly so that uh, terrorism in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, substantive, uh, casualties, even though every casualty matters, human life matters, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about, even though six individuals get killed in the United Kingdom and, and the United States every year, these are human beings, Matt. But we're talking in terms of the institution of war. Six people are six people, as opposed to 60,000 or 80,000 people. By the way, 85% um, of, casualties, of the casualties of terrorism take place in five countries, mm. uh, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Nigeria and Libya. Uh, so the, the, the overwhelming number of casualties and, and uh, we, we, we hardly tend to make the distinction. But to come back to the point Simon said that the way we react, the way we respond, allow terrorists basically to win in terms of, first of all, we terrorize ourselves, 
We terrorize our public to a great deal as a result of our you know, addiction to this particular coverage and also undermine the democratic values. The democratic values, and that's exactly, I mean, what Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and, and all of them want. They want to undermine the democratic values. And let's come back to, I mean, Donald Trump. Donald Trump, during his campaign, he talked about a ban against Muslims, an ideology, collapsing terrorism with Muslims. That is, you're talking about 1.6. I'm not defending Muslims here, but any, you, you cannot collapse a, a limited phenomenon with a particular civilization. Again, playing into the hands of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and what have you. Again, another element of the question. I mean, think of the way we covered, as you know, before the, the Paris attacks, there was a major attack in Beirut, in Western Beirut, in which 200 people were killed. It received hardly, and, and this, hardly any attention. I was there. <laughs> but hardly any attention in, in, this, in Beirut. Yeah. I was in Beirut too. And there was a great deal of controversy. Why BBC and CNN mm. does not really respond to the, an attack that killed hundreds of people were in Paris? Again, they, it, it tells you a great deal, but that's a different situation. But to come back to the central question, mm. terrorism, really, the way we react, the way we respond to terrorism basically has tremendous significance mm. to the terrorists and also to the values, not just Donald Trump, Populist movements throughout Western societies now are using and abusing terrorism. They're collapsing terrorism with migration, with refugees, with cultural entities in order to basically, I mean, for political ends, yeah. undermining the democratic values in Western societies. And Douglas, I mean, you know, the third question I thought was really interesting as well because it touches on an issue that we haven't got into very much tonight. But because semantics matter, the very definition of this word terrorist that we bandy around so freely, uh, but which I think means many different things to many different people, um, it has become synonymous with uh, Islam somehow in the minds. It has been falsely mm -hmm. collapsed, as you have said, in the minds of many people to the point now where an American man goes and, and if he's white and takes a, you know, an, an AK to his nearest shopping mall and or goes into a uh, African-American church and kills 12 people, he's not called I a mean, terrorist. He's called d deranged I mean, I, or I, I, disturbed or, you know, and I wonder, Douglas, if you, know, if you have any thoughts on the idea of how we appropriate the, the sort of how we use this term terrorism mm. and who we choose to call the victim of a terrorist attack and who is just yeah. the victim of a, of a lone crime, wolf. Crime. Or I mean, I mean this, if I may just make two points on this very quickly. One to the lady up there. I mean, I don't think we should beat ourselves up too much about the coverage of terrorist attacks that have a proximity to where we are. This always happens after a terrorist attack. Now you'll say, you know, why? As far as says, you know, why have you got so much attention on Paris and less on Beirut? It's because Paris is Paris and Beirut is Beirut, and Paris is near <laughs> us, and most people feel more kinship, and they've probably been to Paris, and more people have been there than they've been to Beirut. I mean, you can always play this game; it's regrettable, but it's not. It's not only us, you know, in our country that feels like that. Um, when something happens near you, it's it's of more import to you than if it happens far away, and sadly. The Middle East feels far away for most people, and so of course that, that's going to be the case. We might regret it, but it's not unnatural that that's, that's the way in which it's, the things are covered. Secondly, on this thing, as it were, about motivation, I, there's another thing that happens now after any terrorist attack, which is, uh, it happened uh, uh, recently of, um, uh, what was it, there's a sort of graphics that get sent around Facebook, social media, Twitter, all that kind of thing, you know, the number of people killed each year by I don't know, lawn mowers versus the number killed by terrorists. You know, everyone has a great chuckle. You know, you're more likely to be killed by your toaster than you are by it. You know, and, all, and that, also, it, it, that also sort of skews the whole debate because, you know, I don't deny those stats in certain countries. By the way, they always tend to be, you know, things like a, uh, how many people have been killed in America by terrorism since the 12th of September 2001? You know, Six that people, sort of thing. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the point is, is that this, but this is, so, so you go, you know, it always starts from a certain date that, pre, that you know, helps the statistics as it works. If you did it 24 hours earlier, you've got to put in 3,000 more people and so on. Same with Paris. They don't pass around the Paris uh, uh, death toll statistics on the same amount because they're, they're not, not, not as sort of giggly uh, for a bit. Um, but again, I mean, like, I don't deny that a toaster can be dangerous or a lawnmower, but if there were a movement deliberately making dangerous toasters, <laughs> 
you know, or deliberately miswiring lawnmowers to make sure they kill their owners. You know, I'd want to know about it, and so would you. And, and that's what we're dealing with, movements that actively want to do this. And so, of course, there's a, there's a disproportionate emphasis on that, because that's what matters. Um, first of all, uh, you're absolutely correct. Proximity, proximity matters, uh, cultures matter, societies matter, nation matters. But the question on the table here is that the way we report on terrorist incidents color and influence public opinion. If we have a comprehensive, I'm not going to use the term objective, if we have a compre comprehensive and well-rounded coverage of terrorist incidents in the world, the public will get a particular, I mean, objective understanding that terrorism is not just, you're not the only one because you're blonde doctors, you're being attacked. Terrorism is a global phenomenon. Most of the victims are really Beirutis mm, or sure. Aleppo or what have you, point one. Point two, again, Statistics matter, Douglas. Again, sure. since we, we are, we, we're worried about how ISIS and Al-Qaeda manipulate terrorism. So when we tell a British citizen here that the risk of being killed by a terrorist on an annual basis is 1.5 million per year, that your, basically your risk of being killed by a terrorist is 1 in 0.5 million. This matters. Sure. That is, there is, there is, I mean, the risk is, there is a risk, but 1.5. Well, in the United States, is 1.9 million. And so matters. Final point on this one to come back. The reason why, Clarissa, the debate matters a great deal, because the people now, when I say populist movements and uh, you know, identity-driven movements, you're talking about people now who believe in the clash of civilizations. Stephen Bannon and the people around, the gang around our president, I'm an American, subscribe to the idea that there is a clash between the West and the rest, and the rest is body Islam. And the whole idea, and this is matters. So when he says, Trump, you're not reporting on terrorism, Clarissa, enough. He's saying to you, I want you to report on this, I mean, fault line, the Islamic fault line, the Muslim fault line, because he and the ideologues behind him and other people here in the heart of Europe subscribe to this notion that is a clash of civilization. There is no such thing. There is a clash within civilizations. ISIS and Al-Qaeda people, and I've spent really years, I'm not, is about the war with them. This is basically, I mean, it's a symptom, what we're witnessing this here. Is an and that's what point. we're not telling people. Yeah. This is a war within civilization. It's not about war between Islam and the West. Okay, let me take some more questions because we've got so much good stuff we're talking about. Uh, yes. So um, I think it's unrealistic to ask media to stop covering terrorism in general, since way before this era of terrorism, if it bleeds, it leads, has kind of been the way journalist has been act, uh, journalism has been acting. Um, however, Simon did bring up a point in that it, terrorism is unique in that media themselves are implicated in the story. The question is, do you think that as a result, media should not be more self-reflective and actually bring this as part of the story to the public, that they themselves are a part of the story? and not educate the public on that role that they're playing, as well as educate the public on how they too could play a role by doing things like posting on social media and fanning the flames even further. Okay, good question. <laughs> Who, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Hi there. Hi there. Um, my question is, instead of talking about whether they should be deprived or not deprived, actually talk about what oxygen we're actually giving them, because a lot of the words and terminology that we use, sometimes they're very unclear. For example, we use the word Islamic extremism. But what does Islamic extremism mean? I mean, somebody here might think, well, if it's Islamic extremism, it has to be something to do with Islam. On the other side, the terrorists are actually getting happy because they paradoxically, when you say Islamic terrorism to them, they think, oh, it must be, it has to do something with us. And so we have to retaliate because they've got, got this paradoxical mind that if they talk about us, exclusively just about us, that it has to be something wrong with them. Because they've already been brainwashed into thinking whatever they say is a conspiracy theory. And so when we sort of exclusively point them out instead of just saying that they're terrorists, they actually get fuel for that. So my question is, is it really about whether we should or shouldn't give them oxygen and more about what oxygen are we actually giving them? Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Uh, ba -ba -ba. Yes, hello. Oh. Hi. Um, to the extent, right. to the yes. extent that the m media shows restraint, is there not a danger that social media will fill the vacuum, fill it with lies, and then the, the 
official media has got a decision. Does it now report on what the social media is saying, or does it still restrain itself? Exactly. It's a very difficult trade-off. Where does the panel think that the line should be drawn? Good question. Okay, well, let's start, Simon, with the first question, which was directed to you. And this was an interesting idea. Should the media bring this whole question of media complicity and or you know media's responsibility and media's role to the public and engage in a sort of dialogue about their role, the public's role, is that a productive way of, of dealing with this conundrum somehow? Well, I mean, yes, it sort of answers the last question as well, which is, which is and this is new, how do we handle social media? Mm -hmm. I mean, once we had a nice monopoly, I mean, the journalism profession uh, and the big media organizations had it all their own way. Um, now we're being challenged by new means of communication and, uh, and we're in trouble, or we're regarded as being in trouble. I personally think editing is going to come back. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think they're going to be regulating the social media. Uh, Google and Facebook are going to be under huge pressure to, to, to moderate what they're doing. Um, we're in a period of anarchy at the moment, so I think it'll change. And that'll answer some of these questions at least. But, I mean, um, uh, yes, uh, whenever there's a, a horrific incident, I mean, I and other people usually write an article saying exactly the same thing. Please don't over-exaggerate the implications of this incident. Um, spitting in the wind. But at least you feel you're saying what you believe. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I just think, I think that, I mean, I agree. The, 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 nothing's going to change if it bleeds, it leads. Um, on the other hand, um, when, and I come back to this point, there's a particular thing about a terrorist story which is unlike any other story. It is not like our normal stories where we're standing back and we're putting up a camera and witnessing something. We're actually, we're actually a part of the story. And to that extent, the only way of handling it, I think, is, is as you suggest, to try and explain that we're part of this story. It's not dissimilar, though, in the US for mass shootings, where some reporters mm. have elected not to give the names mm. of people who perpetrate these, because it's, again, you know, and we've had incidents where shooters have actually gone so far as mm. to murder people on live mm. television or on webcams to try mm. to, you know, and then you do have this incredibly uncomfortable mm. relationship where the media is part of the story. Well, I mean, I, I, I would like, I would like in these, circ in these peculiar circumstances for there to be some sort of of, of, of um, and collect, collective discussion as to how we ought to restrain ourselves. Mm. Um, I don't care what the word censorship. I mean, censorship is editing. Uh, you know, uh, I'm an editor, you're a censor. Right. Um, uh, th 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 that's not the point. The, po the point is, how do we decide how we cover a story? Mm. Do we cover it ad nauseam, or do we cover it a little, or do we cover it just enough? Uh, what are the words we use to mm -hmm. determine how we cover a story? This is, this is the daily bread of newspapers. It's not the daily bread of the social media yet, but I do believe it will one day be that. Okay. Fawaz, the second question was about, you know, is it less about giving them oxygen to breathe or what kind of oxygen we should be giving them? And talking specifically about this idea of Islamic terrorists as opposed to terrorists and, and whether that conflates the issues. And I guess I would just piggyback on with that question. Isn't terrorism already such a loaded word in terms of semantics? Well, I mean, words matters, uh, not for our president. Uh, 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 they matter a great deal. Uh, for me, as an educator, I mean, we, we, the first thing we say, to precision, precision, facts, realities. For eight years, Barack Obama never used the term, uh, you know, Islamic. Uh, radicalism or and Islamic. he was criticized heavily very very for much that. and he lost the argument in the United States because he was basically portrayed as a weak president a president that does not have really fire in the valley that he on and on he really lost it in terms of public opinion and and uh, Trump played on this very very well uh, but again to come back to what Trump and company are using now Islamic radicalism it's a code word uh, it's a code word in the eyes and ears of millions of Muslims, it means Muslims. He's collapsing, uh, you know, uh, Muslim extremism. Why not call it Muslim extremism? Well, what's wrong with this term? But to Bannon and to the ideologues behind the president, Islamic radicalism and Islamic terrorism basically connote the fact, because Islamic, the term Islamic mm. is, 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 connotes civilization. Do you think that's we use the term Islamist. I use the term Islamist. Sure. Islamist is basically, we, we have invented a term yeah. which really doesn't mean anything. I use the term jihadism. Again, jihadism is a very loaded word because mm. the institution of jihad is like the institution of just war in Christianity. Mm. That is, you can really activate the institution of jihad when aggression, when you are can faced I, with aggression. But can I ask you the first? Do you want to see if you think it would get better, as it were, in the Islamic world, for want of a better term, 
if you called it Muslim terrorism? No, I mean, extremism. Uh, Muslim but extremism. Because terrorism... But what if you call it... Are you saying we should call it Muslim extremism? Extremism, absolutely. Or just I mean, extremism? They, no, no. They, in, in, in the world of Islam, they use Muslim extremism. You have sure. Muslim, you have a Christian extremist, you have a Jewish extremist, sure. you have black extremists, whatever. This is a neutral term. But the term Islamic, the term Islamic in Islamic studies basically connotes a civilization. That is, Islamic studies, Islamic culture, Islamic... And here you're adding Islamic. That's how it's seen. And the reason why Barack Obama and his administration, because they were concerned about how basically the term resonates with, in the Muslim well, world. I mean, I'll, 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 I mean, this word terrorism, and someone said, what is terrorism? Mm. I mean, I, I kept, I, terrorism is a word for a method of it, violence. It's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's like a gun, okay? A, a Muslim gun, Muslim terrorism. Mm. The, the purpose of the, of, of the gun that is terrorism is to gain publicity. Yeah. That's mm. my problem. Because, yes, I mean, the question is, I mean, the question is, is that, there is extremism. There's a great deal of extremism in the world of Islam today. We agree on that. I mean, that's... Uh, and we can explain why there is a great deal of extremism in the world of Islam. And yes, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are an integral part of Muslim extremism. Why? Because they're using and abusing certain values and norms and doctrines in a very narrow... And we, we all talk about that. I mean, I highlight yeah. all that, please. ISIS, a history. <laughs> uh, it's in paperback. It's uh, <laughs> just <give. laughs> All good bookshops. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I, no, I'm seriously, I worry again to, to reiterate when the President of the United States uses a loaded term, and this is the kind of oxygen, this is the kind of, this is cultural <clears throat> overtones. Because that's exactly what, I mean, it, what they want to hear. They want to, in the eyes of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and the rest, basically, they are defending the Islamic Ummah. They are standing up against the you know, decadent West, the aggressive colonial West. And what Donald Trump and company are saying, we hear you. We're also standing up for the West, and this is a kind of a clash of civilization. But Douglas, I want you to respond to that, but I wonder if you can do it also in the context of answering the gentleman's question, which was about this idea of we can editorialize and use this you know, nice bit of sophistry that kind of takes the edge off of things and makes us all feel quite happy with it. But are people then just going to go to social media where they can mm. hear the real tough talk and you know, cut through the bull, as yeah. Americans would say? Um, I'll, can I answer that first, if I may? Um, we live in an extraordinarily perilous time in general with information in this regard at the moment. And let me give you... Uh, two very quick examples that don't have directly to do with the thing we're discussing tonight, but which, uh, which speak to it. Um, the way in which you can now pump a lie or a rumor straight into the mainstream news is far more worrying than I think people are aware of. And let me give you two very quick examples. Um, uh, 18 months ago, uh, uh, when a, a Conservative Party donor who was disgruntled that he hadn't been given a place in the cabinet for his cash donations, um, releases a biography of the then Prime Minister making the most lurid possible claim with no source that any newspaper in this country would, would stand up and publish on the back of about something the Prime Minister was alleged to have done as, as an undergraduate at Oxford. Those of you who know, I'm not going to repeat it. Um, <laughs> But uh, that was said in a book published by the author at the author's expense, the disgruntled former friend of the Prime Minister's. He managed to pump that claim directly into the system of the British press, and it was on the BBC and everywhere. Why? Because the papers know that if they don't repeat the allegation mm. that is baseless and so on, it's all over the internet, and all their readers are going to go over the internet. Let me give you another example of that. A, a, a claim made before, or around the time of the late, recent election, uh, no, after the election, before the inauguration of Donald Trump, about uh, uh, allegedly compromising uh, information from the Russians. Without saying any speculation about where it comes from, again, a story which normally a newspaper would not be able to run because there's no source for it, there's nobody backing up the claim, is put into, into a website which then is so lurid that it goes all around the world. And before you know it, the Times of London is reporting the lurid thing that nobody ordinarily would pick up because it's on the net and they know that all of their readers are going to disappear onto the net otherwise. So if that can happen with these sort of grotty, you know, innuendo stories, we have to consider how vulnerable we are in general to much more serious stories now. And I think, it, I think that that dividing line has become very, very dangerous. Just very quickly to respond to the point about Fawad's about this. I, 
I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical than you are about this because, I mean, over three presidents now since 9-11, they've all taken a different tack, and the response has pretty much been the same. Uh, nobody likes to remember this, but what was the first thing that George W. Bush did as president after 9-11? He went to the Islamic Center in Washington, read his favorite bits of the Quran, and insisted Islam is a peaceful religion. This has nothing to do with Islam. Okay, no, and everyone, of course, subsequently... You know, nobody gave him credit for it, but that, that was George W. Bush. Uh, 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 Barack Obama refuses to say the term Islamic extremism when uh, 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 um, a man shouting Allah Akbar at Fort Hood uh, kills a, a dozen uh, uh, Marines. It was described famously as workplace violence. And, um, and so this thing comes up. What are they holding from us? Why are they lying to us? We can see what it is. Why are you not saying that the guy shouting Allah is greatest whilst gunning people down may be doing it for theological reasons? And you start to do the contrary mm. thing. And that's why you now get, as I say, this, this situation. It's the same thing, as I say, with the migration, with European politics and all this stuff. The public aren't onto nothing when they're worried that the media is holding some of this stuff back from them. As the, I mean, Barack Obama was berated at the UN by David Cameron for this. It was Cameron who said at the UN a, a, a year or so ago, you know, it's not enough that you say it has nothing to do with religion. You've got to admit it has to do something with religion in order to deal with it. But, but we are creating contrary forces all the time mm. at the moment. Mm. Excellent point. Another round of questions. Sorry. Um, hi there. Oh, sorry. Should I wait on? No, go for it. Okay. Um, this is really fascinating. So thank you. Um, I, I was curious. We're obviously talking a lot about the media and whether or not we should, you know, talk about this or not talk about this, and where's the line and blah blah. And I wonder, you know, we're talking about the fact that it's you're really unlikely to be involved in a, a terrorist attack, and you were saying, you know, should we be asking them what they want instead, is not talking about it the solution? Mm. Or, and, and what is? What is the solution? Right. Should we just not talk about it at all and it'll all go away? Are we inflating our own importance in all of this maybe as well and we could stop talking about it and it would still keep happening? <laughs> Probably just following on from that, um, are we financing terrorism by providing the oxygen of publicity? Okay. And number three? Okay, yeah. Uh, hi, the um, Simon Jenkins position is um, incredibly plausible and, and a sort of desirable position for the, uh, the educated elite, which was a phrase he used. But we here probably represent a, a vastly disproportionate proportion of the, of the population at large. And my question for the panel is, are we not in danger of underestimating uh, the reaction of the wider population that the educated elite is imposing some sort of self-censorship and therefore creating suspicion? Excellent question. And if we can keep our answers a little brief, do, do you want to start with that one, Simon? Because you look sort of um. inspired to speak <laughs> there. Are, are, we, are we out I, of touch? I, 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 I come back to something Douglas said. I, mean, I sense we are, everyone thinks the moment they're passing through is some terrible crisis. And uh, 50 years ago, everything was so easy and simple and straightforward. And, golden age. Um, uh, I'm not sure that's going to be true, but um, it is clear that the technology of, of social media, um, coupled with the particular phenomenon we're discussing tonight, terrorism, is producing a, 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 a kind of critical mix, which we find very difficult to handle. I, I sort of believe, because I'm an optimist, um, that we'll sort it all out in the end. We'll muddle through, somehow it'll be okay. I don't know why I think that, but that's just my, my outlook in life. But do you think we're but, out of touch? But, I mean, that's well, basically what we're hearing, well, that this the, whole the, conversation... The, 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 the is, 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 is if, we, if we don't... If we don't I'm sort of my, my subscript to what he's saying. If we don't cover terrorism big, um, people won't trust us anymore. Mm. Uh, and and that, that's a worry. That, that would really worry me. And the reason why they may not trust us anymore, or the reason why their lack of trust matters, is I'll go to social media. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there, there are two or three new elements at, at, at play here. And I don't know the way through this. I just know that, that, that good, responsible media journalism ought to stick to its guns. It ought not to exaggerate. It ought to explain. It ought not to censor. Mm. It ought to explain. But it ought not to get um, frightened by the fact that irresponsible social media are doing other things. And, and, and I do think, as I said before, about, about Google and Facebook and all these other social media activities, I am convinced that within 10 years' time, they'll be properly regulated in some sense. Okay. Now, that may be a, an undemocratic thing. It may be a, an elitist thing. I don't know. But I just think the, the degree of, of reckless irresponsibility you do see now uh, with, with the social media will be brought under some sort of control. Mm. 
Okay, Fawaz, do you want to take the question about are we financing terrorism? Uh, how? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess the idea being, are we making money out of terrorism and giving terrorist publicity in the process? I mean, we know, we we, we think we know uh, where the finances, uh, you know, for ISIS uh, come from. Uh, multiple sources, uh, basically most of it uh, in the region, uh, in the Greater Middle East and the Islamic world. Whether you're talking about oil in Iraq and Syria or gas, or criminal networks, or donations from certain countries in the wealthy uh, Gulf countries. Uh, also, uh, when Mosul fell to ISIS in the summer of 2014, tens of millions uh, of dollars were basically hoarded by ISIS. And you're talking about ISIS also uh, selling oil and gas to various uh, networks in, in Iraq and Syria. And these operations, most of these attacks basically take very little. You're talking about really uh, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. The big question, uh, to come back to the oxygen. The oxygen is basically coverage, uh, it's cultural, it's social, uh, it's inspiration, motivation, because that's what ISIS and Al-Qaeda want. They want to provide motivation and inspiration for the base, they want uh, recruitment and what have you. Final point about, just come back to about Barack Obama and whether Barack Obama really refused to talk about Islam. In a major speech in the United Nations, Barack Obama made it very clear that there is a major problem uh, in Muslim societies. It was, he was on record by saying that this is a problem, and in fact, when he invited Muslim leaders, he made more than once, he basically addressed Muslim uh, opinion makers and said that Muslim societies and Muslim opinion makers must address this particular challenge in uh, Muslim societies. I mean, again, I, 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 this is not being uh, apologetic or even politically correct. Uh, Muslims are the main victims of this bloody thing. Sure. Muslim societies are basically have collapsed under the weight of extremism, authoritarianism, um, you know, broken politics. Uh, I mean, people don't realize whether you're talking about ISIS or Al Qaeda. ISIS and Al Qaeda basically are a revolt against both the political establishment and the religious establishment in the Muslim world. There is not, in my book, by the way, I mentioned this, I say <laughs> there is not, and, and this is on the record, there is not a single, a single cleric, Douglas, a single cleric in the establishment in the Muslim world that has come in support of ISIS. Mm -hmm. Not even one. Can you imagine, a fact, a, not even a single Muslim cleric from the establishment. In fact, I mean, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and ISIS, their revolt is against the establishment. Yeah. He has called in order to be had Muslim clerics. Because, and again, we, we, when we talk about Islam, this is not to say that there, is not, there are not major challenges, both in terms of institutional and cultural and what have you. But it's one thing to say that, another thing to say, the bloody 1.9 Muslim, uh, 1 billion Muslims are responsible for this thing. They're not. Okay. Uh, we're, we're Question number three, we're going to move on from this topic because yeah, yeah. we can spend all night on it, and it's a fascinating one. But I just want to get to the lady's question here, which is a really good question. Is not talking about it an answer? Are we somehow, in the same way that everyone said when Donald Trump finally came out and said radical Islamic terrorism and the world looked exactly the same as it sure. did five minutes earlier, if yeah. we all just stop talking about it, is it going to make a difference? No, no and the, the, the rhetoric matters, but obviously it isn't everything. It's, it's, it's president is finding out. I mean, obviously, you have to have a viable policy behind it. It's just that people are quite rightly worried that an absence of rhetoric, or at least the apparent you know, unwillingness to get right into the weeds on it, is part of the problem. It just would suggest that you might not actually want to be grappling with it. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's like when you speak to someone, they say, how would you deal with terrorism? And they say something like, you know, we've got to deal with poverty. And they oh, God, well... We'll do that one soon, I'm sure. You know, um, <laughs> um, and so I mean, I mean, it's it's so vague as to be obviously meaningless. Um, but and I, as I said, it's obviously, to my mind, not viable. I mean, you can't tell people not to worry about something that's very near them. And uh, my own view is that for some time, Americans have been overheated uh, about this. 
Uh, and I think Europeans have been slightly underheated on it, actually. Um, but just very quickly, if I may, uh, uh, there, is a, there, is a, uh, um, there is another reason we haven't touched on yet, but it is a, a market force within journalism which we haven't uh, dealt with. In the same way that there was a period when the British police seemed to find it most useful to be on Twitter all day, and uh, finding people who'd aired on Twitter, uh, and people wondered why this was the case, and... I was saying, well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's much nicer to do that than to go and find robbers and, and things. It's, it's sort of yeah. more restful. Uh, in, in the same way uh, for journalists, it's much nicer to report this sort, this sort of the cycle than it is to go onto the ground and do the stuff and actually get people interested in stories which they didn't know that they would find interesting. Mm. I came back from northern Nigeria the other week where I was uh, uh, researching the, the massacres that are taking place there. And, you know, uh, there's not much interest in this country in Nigeria. But part of the reason is that the British press don't send journalists mm. to these places. And so you get around to say, well, our journalists don't want to read about Nigeria, you know. And so it becomes, becomes well, part of it very, very quickly... Another very interesting point of this phenomenon and the complexity of where we are in it. Look at what became the, 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 the picture of the year at the press awards ceremony the other day. Uh, the photograph of the assassin of the Russian mm -hmm. ambassador in Turkey standing over the body of a man who was, dead only, oh, who was alive only seconds before. Standing over that. Now that yeah. was all over the press. And we had no problem with it. It was a dead Russian on the floor by a live, heated... Uh, uh, and when you consider that the British press has no problem doing that, mm. but absolutely, you know, pardon my French, you know, needed to change its trousers over reproducing a cartoon a few years earlier, you realise the sort of craziness that we're in. Yeah. You know, you're taking your life in your hands if your publication publishes a cartoon, but everyone's got the dead body of the Russian everywhere. Okay, we are drawing to the end of our evening, so we don't have time for more questions. I'm going to have each of the panelists in a minute or less, please, beginning with you, Douglas, oh, just God. summarize your thoughts, and then we'll do another show of hands and oh, see how you have all I been... I didn't just stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of it. No, um, <clears throat> no, I would just say that, uh, that I, I think we're probably... Uh, there's a fair amount of agreement, honestly. I mean, I think we all recognize that journalists have to exercise a degree of restraint. Uh, the, the, and, uh, and I think we recognize that there are times when journalists don't and that, that, that it, it, we get it wrong. Um, I think we're all in agreement on that. There is one element of this, by the way, which I mean, always troubles me, and you've got to be careful about how you say this, but I do think the extent to which the public uh, uh, um, behave on this also matters. You know, the, the argument that journalists always use is, well, it's what the public wants, and then you miss the crucial thing of, well, what, the, the public aren't an entirely, you know, sort of amorphous, you know, collection of, you know, um, of, well, I, I wouldn't use it anyway. But, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, insert. Uh, uh, um, but you know, they are all, the public, we know, we are also uh, um, uh, moral beings, and we can draw our own lines on this. I just do think that, to an extent, we also all have to be aware of this. Mm. Do we click? on the, you know, do we Google, you know, when right. uh, you discover that somebody's emails have been hacked, do we Google for the hacked emails and then all have a great laugh about it? Because if we do on that, then we probably do on the other stories as well. Good point. Fawaz, one minute well, or I, less? I mean, I, I, I think probably, uh, as Dr. said, I, we're not disagreeing a great deal. I, my take on it is that we need to give the context, we need to be proportional, uh, we need to put the whole phenomenon in perspective, in comparative terms, we need to tell the audience, all of us, uh, that uh, this particular phenomenon has particular roots, uh, that what we are seeing in the West here basically are reverberations of a great social and political <coughs> evil in the Muslim world. And I think most importantly, um, uh, we need to show resilience. Uh, you know, it's amazing about the, the... I was in Beirut, too, during the attacks. What was it, 2015 or 16? Mm -hmm. It was the day before Paris. Uh, 200 people... Uh, were brutally killed by ISIS in West Beirut. Two hours later, the city, I mean, took care of the dead, they buried the dead, and the city. Two hours later, I went to the same place, back to normal. Of course, deep scars, but the city was able to show resilience, was able to... In Paris, I mean, I, I was there in Paris. I mean, the city was traumatized mm. for two, three weeks. I mean, Paris, it... And again, the, the idea of resilience, the idea, and, and at the end of the day, I mean, I, I think we're very harsh on the media uh, because we, we need to talk about the public. Fear is the greatest beast. 
that and, and, and that's what, mm. I mean, ISIS and Al-Qaeda traffic in fear. And in this particular sense, how do you restrain this particular beast? That's the question. Simon? All we have to fear is fear itself. Yes. A, a, a mm. famous phrase and, and unbelievably true. Um, I have nothing much to add. I mean, I, I, we, we mustn't be afraid. Uh, they want us to be afraid. We mustn't be afraid. Uh, my worry is, and, and I think I do disagree to say, with my colleagues here, I think it's, it's a massive problem for the press. I just think we have got to find whole new forms of self-restraint, and we haven't shown it yet. And I don't know how we're going to do it, but I just think it's, it's got to be done. And, and, uh, and I don't think it's satisfactory to say, well, if we over-restrain ourselves, the social media will do it for us. It's like saying, I'm going to go and rob the bank because someone else will do it if I don't do it. Um, uh, th that's not what we're about. The best solution, however, is, is, is not to go on talking about it. So let's go home. Well, OK. <laughs> on that note... I'd like to get one last show of hands. Uh, those in favor of the motion, we give too much publicity to terrorists. Raise your hands, please. Gosh, you did a number on them, Simon. <laughs> and, those, and those against, those who do not believe we give them too much? And anyone still who doesn't know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of with you guys, actually. It is a very <laughs> complex issue. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists and to our